introduce uh, our amazing panelist, Linda Zade is CEO of Epic Semiconductors. She develops uh, self-powered, self-learning nanoscale chips that mimic nerve and brain cells, driving revolutionary advancements in ambient intelligence. Uh, Amir Faizpour is the founder of Aggregate Intellect, building a generative business brain for service and science-based companies. Amir has built and grown a global community of 5,000 plus AI practitioners and researchers gathered around topics in AI research, engineering, product development, and responsibility. And Sahar Nizami is senior director at the Bank of Canada, where she heads the analytics and insight practice. Uh, she has more than 18 years of experience building, growing, and leading data and analytics in various teams. So the first question, uh, I think uh, I'll go to Sahar. Tell us more about uh, what you do and what is the potential opportunity you see in leveraging the expertise of the Iranian tech diaspora to improve Persian language support in AI models? Sure, thank you. Is this working out? Okay. Um, hi, uh, Sahar Nazami. I work at the Bank of Canada. My teams uh, work on analytics, obviously, but the whole range of it. So from descriptive analytics, business intelligence, decision support, all the way to advanced analytics. And we do a little bit of uh, quantum computing um, um, proof of concepts as well. Chall oh, challenges, yes, my challenges. Um, I actually did ask um, both the Iranians around me as well as the data scientists that I work with, and I ask them, where, where do you think these challenges are? Um, is it data? Is it rules? Is it um, like regulations? So again, like I'm crowdsourcing the answer for you, <laughs> but it seems, so the corpus of data is there. There is a lot of data. Um, it's going to be generated even more and more because, you know, um, all of these models need a lot more data to train themselves on. So. Uh, one of the recent talks I was um, listening to was talking about um, they're going to get better at converting speech to uh, text just so that they can train themselves better. So hopefully uh, what you're looking for is going to come as well. Um, but it's also the acknowledgement that we have to make of, um, especially in the recent years, I think uh, there's a lot of bias in our data. So be aware of that. I think there is a little intelligence that we have to uh, insert in our data. And the censorship, like, take out that from our data. And I'll give you an example. Um, it took me a while to find out why everybody, um, like in Facebook, the first early years of Facebook, I was like, how is the last name of a lot of the Persian people on Facebook, like Irani? Like, all of them. Like, you, you, you ingest, like, um, profile names from Facebook, and you think 50% of the Iranians have the last name of Irani. But that's... And then you realize, oh, that's the way that they're anonymizing it, right? So, and then add censorship on top of that. So a lot of the text that is probably generated from inside Iran and social media is self-censored and self-corrected. So um, be aware of that. Like, that, that's one thing that we have to do. Um, um, and then the second thing is what um, gets me to my second point, which is I think another challenge is, you alluded to it as well, Davarjan, um, the things that people can't do, the things that companies can't do. So what's our awareness and what's, how much of this awareness are we sharing with everybody else? What's our awareness of the legal um, you know, implications? Uh, Ashley, you talked about regulations. Like, regulations are so, so, so very important. So finding out what we can and we cannot do. And then trying to change the things that we cannot do. So like the advocacy that we need to you know, start using, can we, like how do we talk about sanctions and how do we, um, like what are the things that we can advocate for removing or excluding from the sanctions? So that's another thing. Uh, intellectual property, finding out about intellectual property. I know that in Iran they can, I don't think we're part of the global copyright rules and everything like that. So they can take a book and they can translate it in Iran and they can publish it. So. It kind of feels that if I, if I upload that Persian book and I do have the original English book, I could start you know, training a little bit on translations, but then the translation was not authorized. Um, do I have the right to kind of like now um, compare them together or not? So, so learn about that. And the third one that I will add uh, to me, it's the most important one, um, find good use cases. Like, why are you doing this? You had a reason for the use case that you have, right? There's, this wealth of stories that you want to keep and you want to share and you want to you know, pass on like this incredibly rich culture that we want to pass on through language and th through speech and everything like that. So find your use case. Um, I have a few um, 
that I'm passionate about, but I'll leave that one to if, if we are talking about opportunities later on. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, Amir, tell us more about your work and also how can the um, diaspora tech community help unlock um, its full potential when it comes to this problem? Yeah, definitely. So I, I think I admit I'm part of the problem because I have worked on languages for the past six or seven years. Uh, my background is in quantum computing, but then I moved to industry. And from pretty much day one, I've been doing natural language processing. And until literally when I was invited to this panel, I never sat down and thought about, okay, what about Persian language? I'm a Persian and I haven't thought about it. So I think you know that that's a big responsibility that I think I'm gonna take away with myself after this. But uh, I, I see three areas of problem really and challenges that we have. Area one is data or at least that's what I thought until this morning when I looked it up. So uh, English language is the most resourceful language and that's what, what's used from the internet to train these large language models. That takes about 55% of the internet that is used to train these models is English. And I thought, well, Persian is probably 0.0001%, that's why we don't have good performance. But I looked it up this morning and it's 2%. And the second most resourceful language where language models uh, perform pretty well on is in the range of 5%. So the data is there. But the problem is that the data doesn't make it to the training sets. So when I looked at the training set for the models that were used to train GPT-3, which is the back end of chat GPT, uh, English is 45%, uh, and Persian is 0.07%. So the drop is huge. So half of the content on the internet that we have doesn't make it, more than half of it doesn't make it to training sets. And that means that we don't have people who care enough and or incentive, incentivized enough to sit down and. And there are, of course, a lot of other technical problems. So that problem, that's challenge one. Challenge two is around alignment. Uh, so the reason that ChatGPT performs as well as it does is the so-called alignment. So a bunch of people at OpenAI, well, incentivized by OpenAI sat down and created a specifically data set that has taught GPT, ChatGPT, what is valuable, useful, and not harmful. So, and that's great, that's something that is needed. But what is that missing is the cultural nuances of language. How about alignment to things that I care about? How about alignment to things that all persons care about, right? So none of that is done yet. And the third challenge that I see is around business incentive, which you also pointed out. Uh, use cases are important, but also it is important to remind ourselves that the reason that English language models are so good is that Microsoft is throwing money at it. Google is throwing money at it. There are you know, uh, funders, engineers, creatives out there who are spending their days and money to make this work. And we need more of that. I think we have funders in this crowd, we have engineers, we have creatives. We just have to figure out how to bring all of it together uh, to do something for Persian language as well. Wonderful, and uh, obviously big companies like Google have the data sets, we just need to advocate for them. We need to be able to be there responsively and talk about how we wanna use them. We need to ask them to add a listen button. Uh, these are things that our community can do and it doesn't take a lot of effort. Uh, Linda, could you please tell us more about yourself and also how something like this can uh, benefit the wider Iranian community? Thank you very much for having me. Yes, m my name is Linda Zade, as you introduced. You know, thinking starts with feelings. And in biology, that's done by nerves. And in technology, that's done by sensors. And that's what we do at EPIC. We make sensors that they feel, think, and respond. In regards to the importance of this, channel, uh, this panel, I wonder, we are sitting here analyzing why the computers cannot speak Farsi fluently. And we are sitting here analyzing that in broken English. So there must be something, maybe we want to, the computers to understand us. But anyway, what I'm trying to say is that 
the, all these big organizations like Alexa, Microsoft, they, when they invest something, there must be a justification for their investment. So there is nothing about saying that, oh, what's, what's wrong? There is nothing wrong. It takes time. Sooner or later, the computers, they speak any language. We will be allowed to, or we will be enabled to even speak with dolphins. And uh, in terms of the hardware, Alexa and other things, um, I don't, again, I don't see any problems because any $2 microcontrollers with a microphone and a speaker will do the job. And these natural language models, they exist. Uh, so uh, what uh, I think the purpose must be, must not be to feed into an existing AI model, but to disrupt, innovate, and lead this landscape of AI. Thank you. Absolutely. So what she's referring to is knowledge bases. So I'm currently working with several Pulitzer Prize journalists who, and creating knowledge bases for them. Because, believe it or not, in the last six months, because of Gen AI, there are uh, off-the-shelf uh, chatbot builders that you can use that already respond in 20 languages. And so feeding the knowledge base of these journalists uh, in a confined way to be able to create their own knowledge base where when audiences respond, they can get that information. It's the same thing. We don't need to start by going very big. We can start by actually going very small. All we have to do is the next iBridge is a storytelling project. And you open it up and you crowdsource it and you ask your grandparents to send in a four minute tape of them talking to each other, right? Like, you can define what it is that you want. Do you want voice or do you want text? But it's very doable. And in fact, Amir and I were talking about uh, Hugging Face, which uh, has a data set called Bloom, which is an amazing way to model uh, potentially what we do around this in the future. Um, we're going to ask, answer, uh, go ahead and do one other quick round of questions and open it up to you. And if somebody can time keep, because lunch is at 12.45, and I know everyone wants to eat. OK, so um, uh, I think what would be really helpful is um, to go a little bit more deep, Amir. And let's talk about if we were to begin with a corpus of 1,000 books. Let's just say we're going to pick 1,000 books or 1,000 digital experiences. Uh, what are some of the uh, technological ways that we can come about this regardless of the fact that there will have to be editorial ethical considerations about what are we choosing, how many are we choosing, are we diverse, are we you know, responsible with privacy and data, just kind of walk us through what that would take. Yeah, definitely. So, um, I mean, the, the problem with Persian language to some extent is, is the fact that it is so-called a low resource language, which means that it doesn't not enough people have worked on enough high quality data sets that can be used for language modeling, but also, as I said, for adding the cultural nuances and alignment, right? So uh, th that's the first effort that I think needs to happen. Like, you know, w we need to create incentives. I, I don't know how, but, you know, running challenges, hackathons, uh, you know, some of the investors in the room might specifically, you know, make it a, make a point to look for projects that look to build Persian language models for business. Like, it is not a charity, like it can make money. Uh, there are a lot of Iranians living outside of the country. Um, so it could be a meaningful business, very much like, you know, diversity and inclusion, where we make a point to go after that, but also have the business upside. This is the same problem. Like, the, the fact is that if we have enough funding, we will get enough people, and the technical side is very complex, obviously. Like we, we still have to do a lot of work on how do we properly tokenize Persian language, you know, how, how do we get high quality data, who's going to be the authority to decide what the cultural alignment is, right? Because we, we are from a country of many, many different cultures, and, you know, we have a spread all over the world, so con our culture has also evolved. So 
there are a lot of problems and the list is probably very long, but I think if there is enough funding and if there is enough incentive, uh, there are ways to, you know, bring in like, you know, I, I was, my community was part of the Bloom project that Hug and Face ran, uh, and we were specifically uh, in the multilingual part, like we were creating models and pipelines to remove personally identifiable information from the open source data. We have the capability to do this. It's just a matter of, um, it's just a matter of incentive. It's a matter of purpose. Like it's a, and it can't be altruistic in, in my very honest opinion. There has to be some business upside. Otherwise, it's not going to be sustained. Sure. And as part of the research for this uh, before, as we were doing the Alexa experience, uh, with my background as a journalist, I did some digging. And uh, there was a very well-meaning uh, technologist from Amazon who lives in Canada, and he created an experience online. And I think it's called Bol Bol Zabon. But essentially what he said was, go to my site, Bol Bol Zabon, and you can put in one word and it'll tell you a poem. So it was feeding through an existing Persian language model, right? Well, guess what I did? I typed in Zan Zendegi Azadi. And what did it tell me? It literally told me in Farsi, that is a propaganda made in America. Zan Zendigi Azadi is a propaganda created in the United States. Right? I presented this work at Stanford. The point is that, yes, maybe there's not incentive, but very soon the Islamic Republic of Iran will create a large language model that is Persian, nothing wrong with that because they want to create tools and opportunities. But if we don't get into the game and make sure that the wealth of information that we have in our heritage that grounds us, the poems that you heard, uh, the women that are hidden, some of the poetry that you heard, by the way, uh, were written by women whose poems were not discovered until after they died by their brother. So that first poem was from 1883, and her stuff was found after she passed away. What's the point? The point is that there is a critical moment that we don't want to miss because uh, others might come in to the fray. Uh, I think two quick questions. And are there any questions from the audience? Because I'm going to go to you in a minute. Uh, Sire, you had uh, given one other example of how um, many Iranians who are trying to apply to college or try to get visas, need translation services, they end up paying a lot of money. Talk about that, how some, a tool like this would simplify that. Yeah, you, you want to hear about my rant of the month, which uh, repeats every single month. Um, so I had this, and again, like the technology has been here, right? Um, the technology has been here for many years. So uh, one of my rants of the day with my old team was, um, it breaks my heart to see that um, uh, immigration consultants are charging $40,000, $20,000, $50,000 to help, um, you know, the kids back home apply for a college, like apply for a um, study permit or a work permit. And that was one of the things I was like, the technology is there. Like, why does it, it's a form that we know exactly what you have to fill out. There is, you know, um, there's documents that you know exactly like where your name goes into this and where the rest of it goes. So this was, this was always one of my rants. And going back to, you know, have a business case and have a business case that you hopefully have passion for. That said, I think uh, Martin Bassier will be here. I, I used to go under his posts and put like some of parts of my rants. And then when, when they announced passage, I was like, oh, I hope that that is included there. Uh, but similarly for um, translation services, right? So what are the use cases that we can find that uh, translation is not so freaking expensive? You want to translate, um, you need a translation of your Persian passport here. Everything in it is English. It's English, it's completely English. The only things that are not English is the entry and exit uh, stamps in the airports in Iran. But still, you just have to like pay probably upwards of $100 to get those two stamps translated into English. So like, these are some of the use cases. I'm like, if you can do that, like, or um, actually John, when she talked about uh, Tally, um, my parents go to a um, doctor who's Persian. So it will help, you know, that speech to text recognition is gonna really, really help because not only does the doctor speak Farsi to them, they respond in Farsi, but it's also a combination of like Farsi, but all of the medical terms are gonna be English. So like anything that you can tie it to something that's gonna, at the end of the day, um, 
we also want to serve our communities, right? So community where you live, community where you come from. So tie it to something you're passionate about, tie it to something that has real value as well, because we, we want it to be uh, funded and integrated as well. Thank you so much. And Linda, maybe you could uh, share one other use case that you think of, especially given your line of work where you create sensors. Tell you the truth. Uh, I, again, I, the, my, my challenge here is that I don't see a problem. Uh, and the computers are written in English, so it takes time. And that's what I see. And uh, again, for, uh, for the same reason that we are all speaking English in here. So on the application side, I have a challenge to see the problem that is related to the AI and these big organizations. Again, if this is a cultural thing, it has a cultural aspect, the governments, they must be involved uh, and uh, negotiate with these uh, giants. And uh, in terms of diasporas, someone like me, uh, I don't think everybody likes Calipache. <laughs> so for some, it works, it helps, it's their business, they can utilize it, and there are so many tools. They can use uh, smartphones uh, to do all this uh, stuff. And again, natural language programming in Farsi, all the models, they exist. They get better, but they exist. The hardware, that's what I said again. It's simple things to do. A uh, $2 microcontroller, microphone, and a speaker. That's it. OK, great. We're going to end with a clip. This is a company called Synthasia.io. And I might have to press this. I'm not sure. But um, this is an example of a great uh, company. Uh, they're based in London. And they have added Persian uh, speech to text, text to speech. بسیاری از شما درک عمیقی از زبان و فرهنگ فارسی دارید. شما می توانید بینش های ارزشمندی را به ارمغان بیاورید و امکان ایجاد مدل های هوشمند مصنوعی متناسب با زبان فارسی را فراهم کنید. به اجداد ایرانی خود به عنوان سهامداران خود فکر کنید. به نوه های آینده خود فکر کنید که از شما تشکر خواهند کرد. از اینکه امروز من را در پان خود قرار دادید متشکرم. Okay, with that, um, if there are not any questions, uh, yes, go ahead. Um, just a question, Encyclopedia Iranica. Uh, a big effort, lots of people uh, contributed to making sure that you have a collection of a lot of books. And I know there was an effort to digitize it. Yes. Would that be a source? Has it been digitized? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the late uh, Dr. Yar Shater and I had talked about that years ago. The Encyclopedia Ironica is the perfect place to start. Those have been vetted, they're written by scholars, and uh, that's exactly where we could start with an organization like iBridge, you know, um, potentially a university, uh, and that remarkable wealth of information. Uh, even if it hasn't been digitized, it wouldn't take a long. We could also crowdsource having people read those entries, right? Uh, and translate them, read them in Farsi, to your point, to be able to have a larger corpus of Persian language. If I may add to that, there was a paper a few weeks ago actually called Books Are All You Need. And they showed that you could just train language models on books, English books, and that's sufficient to get a significant portion of the performance of the large language models. And the reason that works so well for English is that companies like Google for Google Books, Amazon for their book business, et cetera, they just literally sat down and scanned every single book and OCR them into digital formats, right? So if there is an effort like that, that's probably all we need, like essentially a properly digitized and cleaned version of all the books that we have, or at least a very good starting point. Great, thank you so much.